Good afternoon. Um, my name is Tom Hacker and I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, this forms part of Landor Link's wider uh, webinar series on the public transport recovery. Uh, and I'm very excited to bring to, to you uh, and share this session today on electric tram style BRT systems across Europe. Uh, I want to introduce myself. My name is Tom Hacker. Um, I've been invited by Landor to help with this session. And I'm, all, I, I'm a transport planner, but I'm also a board member of an organisation called Bus Rapid Transit UK, which some of you will have heard of, some not. It's an organisation which promotes best practice. And we're going to be hearing about some of that best practice or the very best of best practice um, today. Normally, I would have to, if this was an in-person event, I would be doing some kind of housekeeping. I'd be pointing out the fire escapes, the... the uh, the toilets, uh, but you know, different times we are in, uh, it appears, and now we are online. I think this gives us greater access to a wider range of people, and there are benefits which we're enjoying. Um, so, first thing I want to do is to thank Irizar and the Irizar group for helping put together this presentation and bringing together a number of fantastic presenters who are looking forward to hearing from. And I want to thank the Landor Links team as well, Justin and Daryl who've helped um, make this happen. I'm gonna quickly move on to the, the first presenter, but what I want to do is set some of the, the scene for why I personally am very um, interested in, in this type of discussion. And I think there are two very good reasons why we should be talking about uh, electric buses uh, and e-transit and this type of best practice. And it, we need to remind ourselves of them at all points. And the first is the climate emergency. And it is an emergency, uh, a climate and and public health crisis um, due to global warming. Next year in the United Kingdom, we'll be welcoming the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP, um, which will bring again to the forefront of our minds how important it is that we electrify our transport network. Um, and buses will be at the heart of that movement. The second key thing is about social transformation good quality transport projects, which some of the presenters or each of the presenters have been involved in delivering, um, can transform communities, they can connect communities and they can deliver a sustainable economy, which works for everybody. Um, so let's not forget how critical uh, these tools are and what fantastic work uh, some of the presenters and other people in our industry are doing in this space. Um, so we are quickly gonna move on to the first of several speakers. So I will be passing over to Arno Kirchhoff, who is the bus transport unit leader for the International Association of Public Transport. Arno. Thank you very much, Tom. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, pleasure to be on the, on the webinar uh, with, uh, with all of you. And uh, yeah, indeed, um, I was asked to, uh, to make a contribution, uh, maybe as, a, as, a, as an opening of the webinar. Uh, about the uh, electric bus market uh, situation today uh, in Europe and uh, uh, let's say the, the trends also that, uh, that we have observed in the UITP. Um, I should say that from the UITP perspective, uh, International uh, Association of Public Transport, we, uh, yeah, we are in a membership-based organization, so we work a lot Let's say at least I do in the bus unit of UITP with the bus committee, uh, also with uh, lots of our bus uh, members, so mainly the uh, the bus operators, uh, but also we work a lot in, uh, in the bus projects. Uh, we have been doing some projects around uh, electric buses uh, that some of you uh, might uh, know or might remember. It's the, the Zeus project, zero emission transport systems, and uh, more recently the uh, Assured project more focusing on the high high power charging uh, buses uh, but we have also uh, in the past worked on projects around, uh, around BRT business with high level of service uh, and most recently last year we service the full power research foundation on uh, on BRT uh, projects so uh, I will try to um, yeah to go to the next slide and uh, give you an insight of, uh, of what I have collected for you uh, I wanted to start with uh, some, uh, yeah, some of the main driver of uh, the zero emission bus markets uh, in Europe today. Uh, and from there, uh, yeah, leads you through some trends that we have observed uh, in the say, past year, a couple of years, when it comes to zero emission bus 
uh, projects and to specifically implementation implementations across Europe. Uh, I also made an, um, yeah, an, a sample uh, of uh, some examples for, uh, yeah, for, for, for funding, uh, funding schemes, funding possibilities uh, across Europe uh, for sake of information. And then I uh, prepared some concluding remarks, uh, mainly outlining the current and future uh, challenges, opportunities in the zero emission market. Next slide, please. So about the main drivers, uh, yeah, it has been for a long time, uh, of course, we have been speaking about uh, the climate change and the global warming uh, and policy uh, necessity uh, to, uh, yeah, to, support, uh, to support those objectives with the development of public transportation systems. But since very short, uh, we have yeah, also a very important mandatory uh, piece of uh, legislation that comes from Brussels in the form of the Clean Vehicle Directive. Uh, yeah, which will set mandatory uh, public procurement quotas on the, on the member states. So uh, we see this as uh, yeah, as the real uh, driver for uh, for uptake of, uh, of zero emission buses in the coming uh, decade for uh, for Europe. So you see them here uh, in the, on the left side. Uh, so the first target there will be around 45 percent. Uh, of, uh, yeah, of clean buses for the public procurement, which will start next year. And so we, uh, we know that the directive will be implemented in the different member states uh, in August 2021. Um, and already from that moment on, so next summer onwards, this, this target will become effective. So this, this will run until, uh, sorry, until uh, 25. And then uh, the, the procurement target goes even higher to 65% of the public procurement to be clean, uh, clean, uh, clean bus. And each time half of this objective will be, uh, need to be filled with zero emission buses. And of course, we will monitor very closely in, uh, in UITP the implementation of this directive in 27 member states, because this is a process that is currently going on. And we are also supporting the stakeholders in the countries to make it happen in, the, in their country. Um, yeah, uh, next slide, please. In, uh, in terms of numbers, uh, yeah, we like a lot uh, UITP to uh, have also some evidence-based uh, evidence uh, tracking. Uh, so I found back this uh, yeah, this table, which might maybe be a little bit small on the on the computer, depending where you're looking at. Um, but this is the uh, yeah, situation of the zero emission buses in uh, Europe today. Maybe four uh, simple observations out of this table. Uh, that is, first of all, if you see the columns uh, in the table, we see that there are let's say four uh, different types of uh, zero emission buses. And so we distinguish the trolley buses, the battery electric buses, the fuel cell, the fuel cell buses, and also the in motion charging, let's call it innovative trolley buses as a specific type. Second uh, point you can see here on the table is uh, on the right side in the, in the line of the total numbers uh, of zero emission buses in Europe today. Uh, is that we see we count around 5,000 trolley buses in operations, uh, around 2,000. 1,700 battery electric buses, then around 87 hybrid buses, and 36 innovative emotion charging trolley buses. So altogether 7,800 zero emission buses for Europe, which is, and I think we should be also reasonable and a, yeah, a moderate, uh, moderate number uh, if we should compare that, first of all, to the entire public transport fleet in, uh, in Europe, but also, of course, if we should compare that to what we see is happening in, uh, in China. Third uh, uh, yeah, observation from the list, uh, uh, sorry, if you can go back just to the, to the numbers, I wanted just to, to point out that in terms of uh, yeah, the top five uh, countries in the list, as it is here on the screen, uh, you see that the Netherlands are, let's say, the leading country in Europe, uh, followed by the Czech Republic, then Italy, Romania, and Switzerland. So this um, this top listing is uh, of course only true if we consider all the zero emission buses. So you see here there is an influence on the on the trolleys for obvious reasons. If you would only look to the battery electric buses, then the top five list looks a little bit uh, different. Then the ranking uh, is as follows: still the Netherlands uh, on the leading position, but then followed by the UK on the third rank, France, 
followed by Sweden, and then on the fifth place, Germany. And then we have still uh, Norway and Poland. But then after Poland, you see really the numbers drop under the 100 units per country. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, current trends, what we have observed uh, in UITP across the different meetings that we have been doing this year, all uh, online, uh, as yeah, as one of maybe the bigger trends is what yeah, what we call this the race, uh, yeah, the race to zero emission public transport, with a very strong political uh, political lead. Uh, I think we should also be critical uh, here uh, that we can say that in general we look to the deployment and when we look to the real implementations. Uh, yeah, we have to see that things go quite slow. Uh, it really takes time in Europe to to get uh, to get onto speed. In general, we hear much more uh, about electric buses, zero emission buses, in the webinars, in conferences, in papers. Then we see them uh, on the streets. And uh, actually, in UITP, we started uh, back to 2015 with the global uh, summit and exhibition in Geneva. 2015 already exhibiting quite a lot of electric buses. This is already five years ago in the meantime. And uh, yeah, we have seen in the meantime also in 2017 that the entire bus fleet in a city like uh, Shenzhen uh, in China has uh, already uh, accomplished the electrification of their uh, entire the public transport fleet and uh, yeah in europe it takes some more time um so th there might be sometimes also a distortion uh, between uh yeah, I would say political announcement for let's say zero emission uh ambitions and uh, zero emission uh deployment and what we can uh, observe on the on, on the field but nonetheless we really appreciate this this race that we see now because we we get requests from members we get requests from members and uh, uh, mayors also in UITP asking us well, okay if we if we would start uh, uh, electrifying our entire fleet by 2023 or by 2025 will we be the first city or will we be the first capital in Europe uh, to do so uh, and of course this is important for uh, for the public transport uh, sector that we get this political uh, leadership for uh, for public transportation and uh, yeah my real concern for the UITP is not only the zero emission and electric buses but also uh, the place for the priority for bus services uh, in the more general general fields second trend uh, that we have seen in the past uh, let's say two three years now is really the the scaling up of the of the electrification uh, implementation so we are really at the stage for multi-line uh, and entire network electrifications that are now going on. So this is the real transition uh, that, we, that we see, at least in a couple of countries, but it will probably be followed by many, many countries more. And uh, last but not least, we have the, um, we have the um, uh, more, let's say, technical implementations for, for the um for the networks and sorry i'm here looking for my screen for some reason i only can see myself um i've got a similar problem Anna. so i think um yeah. you're not alone so let's just um give landor a second to bring the uh they've got a small technical issue while we just try and get the, the screen uh, the presentation back on the screen so bear with us just a moment Did you memorize your slides, Arno? That would. <laughs> yeah, I have them in mind. I have them in mind, so uh, I can uh, I can talk about it. Um, it's maybe less less easy to understand uh, when we enter here in the technical uh, the technical part of the I would say of the configurations for uh, for the electric buses because very often. What we see also in UITP that, that cities and uh, the project teams that start uh, deploying their, uh, their, uh, their, their plans are asking about for the charging technology. Uh, what is the best charging technology? Uh, should we go for, uh, for, for, for depot charging, for slow charging, or should we go for opportunity charging? And uh, yeah, for, for, to illustrate this, I prepared two very nice uh, slides uh, from the more recent uh, EBUS uh, deployments in uh, in Netherlands, but also in Norway, where you see, uh, in fact, uh, that in, in the reality where you see 
the 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 scale let's say the scale of the project uh, growing uh, that uh, yeah also the let's say you see uh, the, the combination uh, and the mix of, of charging concepts and strategies that are deployed in one single site right so you have here on the left side Eindhoven uh, which some of you might know they started in 2016 so four years ago already in the Netherlands uh, which is let's say the first uh, down the first city network that has been completely electrified in the, in the Netherlands, um, and um, yeah, they, uh, uh, they operate there. The network is one single brand with 3DL buses, and you can see on the picture below that uh, uh, the charging concept there uh, is used the the slow charging, but also fast charging uh, at the depot in Eindhoven with both the Panto Panto technology. And um, yeah, I think this is something that is uh, a, a case used in Eindhoven, which is very strongly also motivated by the availability of a bus depot close to the to the bus lines to operate. And we have seen that when uh, the, the, the deployment of uh, 100 electric buses in Amsterdam is the same uh, same type of bus, that by an absence of an, uh, of such a depot, they, they built uh, a charging hub inside uh, inside the concession in Amsterdam to to charge the buses. Then on the right side, just to uh, to complement Eindhoven, uh, we have seen a few years later, uh, actually 2019, in the city of Dordrecht, uh, where also an entire city network uh, had been electrified, uh, 37 buses. Uh, also only one brand uh, and it was the second town to get uh, completely electrified in the Netherlands uh, but there uh, you see the, 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 the charging technology used uh, was charging uh, at the depot, slow charging overnight but also with a couple of um, opportunity charging uh, points in the, in the network to, uh, yeah, to mainly have a top-up charging for, uh, for the end of, uh, end of lines. So these are, yeah, two I would say modest uh, networks in terms of size, uh, and let's say around 100 and 200,000 inhabitants. And then on the next slide, you see the things are getting a little bit more uh, complex. Uh, also, deployment numbers are uh, are rising. Uh, so on the left side, again, uh, sorry, I stay here in the Netherlands, but it's uh, the it's the north provinces of Groningen and Drenthe, which have one single PTA. Uh, who actually electrified in the terms of a competitive tender last year for uh, for the entire concession, but there, uh, yeah, they decided to uh, to purchase a high number of uh, zero emission buses, 164, but deliberately they chose there uh, for yeah, three different uh, brands, uh, at least for the vehicles, but also two different brands for the charging infrastructure. And you can see on the picture, uh, picture below, uh, maybe a little bit small, but it's on the on the charging uh, uh, charging station at the depot. So on the front bus, it's it's a French bus from Holies, but behind it's it's another bus from from the Netherlands from BDL. But they are charging on exactly the same infrastructure. And this is something that uh, yeah, that is done on purpose in this concession to say also experiment and to to gain knowledge on the interoperability of the charging infrastructure. And uh, you see here that in terms of charging concepts, they are using both plug charging uh, with the pantograph, but also depot charging with uh, with a, a manual plug. And then last but not least, on the right side, an example from Norway, where I mean, you could say the, the system is even more complex. Uh, as they uh, well, first of all, they they decided to procure at least five different brands, uh, but also different in different concessions and different uh, service contracts. And to our knowledge, this is an uh, yeah, electrification system where you have all possible charging technologies uh, on one single city, namely the overnight charging with, uh, with the plugs, but also the opportunity charging uh, both on the depot and on the routes. And uh, in addition, uh, for the opportunity charging, both technologies are deployed with the uh, Panto up and the Panto down. Then the next slide, please. It's in terms of uh, yeah, funding, of course, very important uh, yeah, to support uh, the speed and acceleration of, of deployment schemes in, uh, in Europe. I should maybe say in the first place that uh, there is not something uh, in Brussels, in Europe, uh, which is a European uh, pot of, uh, of uh, funding, of uh, subsidies. This is something that is 
uh, delegated uh, by the European Commission to the uh, individual member states. So uh, each member state, each country uh, has to organize their national funding programs. That's the first bullet point. So we'll get here an example from Germany where they announced the specific aid scheme uh, up to 650 million euros to be spent until next year, 2021. Uh, and it's a program that will fund the, uh, the, the over cost for uh, electric buses as compared to diesel buses. But also it will fund uh, the charging infrastructure and depot uh, adaptations. In the United Kingdom, uh, we know the green bus uh, funding uh, working for quite some years already and based on the uh, incremental improvement for, for CO2 uh, uh, improvements for, uh, for buses as compared to, uh, to, uh, to benchmark buses. In France, uh, just by means of an example, the programme uh, Moebus by the Ministry of Ecological Transition. So a rather modest uh, sum for the moment, but I expect that this will also be uh, yeah, augmented in, uh, in in future uh, calls. Then, in terms of uh, funding, we also observe uh, quite a lot of regional uh, initiatives, like the one in Amsterdam for the regional PTA uh, for Voorregio for Amsterdam, where they have just uh, last month announced that, uh, also despite the COVID crisis and uh, so the, the 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 crisis in uh, in lack of Fairbox revenue uh, in the whole country, by the way, uh, the PTA still maintained their ambition to uh, continue to invest in, uh, in, in clean buses and, and zero emission buses in Amsterdam with an envelope of 235 million euros uh, called the Corona package. And uh, yeah, more in general, speaking about Corona packages, we, uh, we strongly, uh, I would say, advise and stimulate our members yeah, to lobby uh, to their national uh, authorities and to their national governments to include public transportation as one of the uh, also uh, uh, means to invest in for the recovery plans and of course also to uh, to include the transition to, uh, to cleaner buses in the national recovery plans. Um, fourth bullet point is on Paris. I'm also looking at the time, it will speed up. Um, there are a couple of um, interesting uh, things to learn here as well that uh, the Ile de France Mobility Authority has secured a, uh, a funding from the uh, Connecting Europe, Europe, Europe facility. This is a uh, European fund uh, for support in uh, mainly uh, let's say infrastructure but also rolling stock and uh, yeah, through this uh, innovative uh, funding I think it's, it's a twin funding whereas there's the part from the Connecting Europe facility of 23 million euros, but also a similar amount by, uh, by a national uh, private bank in uh, in France to uh, to uh, to finance the uh, at least in, in Paris the purchase, uh, but also depot conversion towards electric and, uh, and biogas. And then um, yeah, specifically for Central and Eastern Europe countries, so uh, the Baltics and Poland, including also Romania, Bulgaria, there are specific. European regional development funds and cohesion funds. It very much depends on the national preferences if public transportation is included in, uh, in the field of, uh, of, of funding. And last but not least, uh, there are quite some uh, also either institutional uh, banks and private banks active uh, in, this, uh, in this business field. And specifically, the, U the European Investment Bank, as institutional partner of the European Commission, is working yeah, very hard to develop different uh, financing instruments for uh, for clean buses. I think that they published last week the uh, the climate uh, the EIB climate bank roadmap, where they also detail uh, their ambitions in terms of uh, envelopes available for for funding. And um, yeah, the same goes for the European Bank for Re for Reconstruction and Development, where we have together with the UITP this team developed a specific policy paper uh, on electrification in the more eastern part and even going into former Soviet Union countries. Next slide, uh, then I come to, I would say, the conclusions so far uh, for uh, the introduction. Uh, challenges and future opportunities in the zero emission market. Um, yeah, the, the market uh, yeah, is learning. So this this is a lot of doing by learning uh, in Europe, uh, and we can see that at least since 2015, 2016, also the market has pretty much matured. Uh, but yeah, what I said, 
Europe is, is high and large. It goes from, from Finland to Italy and from, from Portugal to, uh, to Bulgaria. So we really have to take into consideration the different, let's say, also abilities of, of countries to, uh, to embrace, let's say, the, the speed and uh, the ambitions of electrification. Sometimes members come to UITP, uh, and especially the, I would say the private operators, with the question, uh, yeah, where is the business model in all this? It is coming with a cost. There are investment costs. There are, uh, uh, there are infrastructure costs. And of course, uh, yeah, the question then there is, uh, what is the ideal model and uh, what is the, also the conditions for success to still make money uh, in, uh, yeah, in being successful in operating and proposing electric solutions. So we are looking in UITP uh, yeah, for the optimal business models. Uh, this is ongoing work with the Transport Economics uh, Committee and Bus Committee. Where we look to the, uh, the model for charging grid owner, the depot owners, bus operators, and new electric infrastructure operators. So we are doing this also in the framework of the UITP trainings. So very much work in progress. We see in the bus committee that the public transport operator, um, they handle the e-bus risks quite well, but they do need support on the infrastructure, depot, and specifically the public space uh, area. Uh, it is demanding to establish fast charge infrastructure. Uh, this is one of the learnings that we got back from the projects in, uh, in Oslo, in Norway, but also in the Netherlands. Uh, so as a rule of thumb, uh, yeah, we say at least two years, we need two years upfront uh, to start engaging with, uh, with the grid owner and with the uh, different stakeholders in, a, in an electrification project before launching a commercial tender for, uh, for services. And then before last on the space requirements, very important that both for the end stops uh, for fast charging, but also uh, the space in the bus depots during the tra transformation yeah, are very important and uh, yeah, hard requirements, which is sometimes difficult to cope with in, in let's say, our historical European cities. And last but not least, uh, a point that uh, yeah, comes back more and more often uh, these days, it is on the uh, yeah, uh, question marks of for the second life of batteries. So we all know that uh, over the lifetime of an electric bus, we will need to replace the batteries uh, somewhere after seven, eight years. Uh, it is a capital component. Uh, and uh, yeah, the question is, uh, if we replace them, can we sell second life batteries for other purposes? And if so, yeah, what is the business model? And also is the ecosystem around the batteries ready uh, in the different countries to uh, be able to cope with that? And uh, I think we do not still have the answer, but it's on the agenda and yeah, definitely part of the future opportunities. And um, yeah, this is very much ongoing, in, uh, ongoing insights uh, because it's very much for UITP also an emerging topic. So we do spread the word in internet through the Clean Bus Euro platform. This is, a, I would say, a service contract that UITP is running uh, for the European Commission, for the DG Move, to support the uh, European Commission and the member states and the cities in, uh, in the deployment of clean bus solutions around, uh, around the cities. There is a very nice uh, toolkit. Uh, I can recommend uh, you to have a look at uh, the website. And we have also yeah, just uh, established cooperation with uh, Sustainable Bus Magazine in Italy to, uh, to populate the marketplaces uh, page on this website. So we are monitoring uh, on a weekly basis the, the incoming new tenders and the awarded uh, clean buses in Europe uh, on a nice, uh, nice map. Um, and uh, of course, uh, if yeah, you can go to the, uh, I would say to the knowledge section of the Clean Bus Europe platform. We also uh, have at your disposal the different UITP reports. We call them the resource papers on the on battery electric buses. The ZS report number two. So we'll soon work on the third uh, third edition update. We have a knowledge brief uh, on the trolley buses and the emotion charging technology and a very nice recently published knowledge brief on fuel cell buses and commercialization approaches across Europe. And these are available for, uh, yeah, for all the stakeholders interested in, uh, in the clean and zero emission buses in Europe. And uh, yeah, for the moment, this was it for, uh, for the introduction. And I hope it was uh, insightful and uh, useful for, uh, for all of you.
Thank you, Erna. Uh, uh, thank you, Anna. Very much appreciate that. Uh, we're going to move on very quickly to Alberto. Um, who Alberto Gonzalez is the commercial director for Irizar Group, um, and you're going to be delivering a, a quick presentation focused on some of the systems that you've been working on. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Tom. Uh, I will talk uh, about uh, the BRT uh, in Bayonne. Uh, first of all, uh, there is a video that you will see. Uh, I don't know if there is some. Uh, if you hear the 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 music no some pictures so this is uh, the interior uh, the charging stations all the passengers inside and the look of the of the vehicle the the stations with the with the docking at the stations on how are uh, changing the the image of of the city The, the interior also, as you can see, the, is very nice. Uh, the luminosity uh, inside uh, was uh, worked uh, by the Public Transport Authority, and uh, it's very, very nice. So yes, I, I will. I would like to say that uh, first of all, we have uh, to see the the BRT as a system we have to have a, a, a system approach and i will explain the different elements of uh, of this system first of all we have the infrastructure we should have dedicated uh, uh, bus lines uh, with uh, traffic signal priority this is uh, very important for the for the performance of, of the brt we should have also the its the fair collection also uh, is uh, very interesting if uh, there is at the stations and we can buy the tickets uh, outside the vehicle and only validate uh, inside because um, we will uh, we will reduce the the dual type time at, at the station and also of course uh, we have uh, as part of the infrastructure the charging station that we will have at the at the terminals then we have uh, the vehicles. Uh, the vehicle configuration for a BRT is, is very very important also because we have to to provide this uh, capacity, but also we have to provide this uh, passenger uh, circulations uh, to reduce, at the, as I said, the, the the dwell time at the at the station, and also of course it's very important the, the design. Uh, because uh, the people, uh, the passenger has to identify the vehicle, and at the end, uh, in a BRT, what we are doing is, is is we are putting at the same level the bus with a tramway. Okay, so when you put at the same level uh, a bus with a with a tramway, I think the propulsion system is very important now because it's electric, also. Uh, for me, a, a BRT that is electric uh, right now is a, is a. We can compare also uh, with uh, with this kind of uh, of uh, transportation mode, and of course, uh, as part of of the another elements, another element very very important is the operations. We have to uh, find out uh, to study the timetables uh, to see the commercial speed, the all the regulations, the inter intermodality. And with all this, uh, when we put all this together, uh, the system should be performance. And for me, what, what is uh, performance? Uh, we have to have a very good uh, travel time. We have to be very, we have to provide to the passengers also a very good frequency and uh, reliability. Uh, of course, uh, accessibility for everybody. Uh, it, it, the vehicle has to be also uh, comfortable. Uh, but with a good uh, capacity uh, and uh, very good also, as I said before, uh, image and identity. Uh, passengers should identify the, the, the vehicle, the system, and at the end, uh, we should provide also a very high standard in, in security and safety. Okay, ne next slide, please. 
So with all these uh, elements and uh, above all focusing in, in uh, the vehicle, uh, we are changing with this vehicle the image of the public transportation. And, and as you can see, uh, the, the city of Bayonne work a lot in the details, not only at the exterior of the vehicle, because uh, Bayonne, uh, 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 Biarritz and, and Anglet uh, were, were the uh, that uh, forced Iriza to, to change the exterior image in that tender. We, we should provide a, a good exterior image of the vehicle. And uh, this ne ne next slide and, and the and the PTA uh, work a lot with us, uh, working also in the interior with all these uh, fancy things like uh, the columns with the names of, of the cities, uh, all the lights, the interior lights, because for them also was was very important um, the the luminosity uh, at night. And also they they ask for uh, the large, uh, very large windows. Uh, next in the next slides, I think we can we can have more more uh, uh, views of uh, these large windows, this luminosity. They ask also for uh, uh, articulations uh, with a, a huge luminosity. Also, now the articulation is a part of the vehicle that is used by the passenger so for us uh, is uh, we did a big work with uh, with the articulation manufacturer uh, providing this uh, big space in this area next slide please so uh, regarding the vehicle configuration as i said for me in a brt uh, one important thing is to reduce the dual time at the station and for that we have to improve the accessibility and the passenger flow at the station uh, this is one of, of the point. Uh, then also we have uh, large windows. Uh, this is a with these large windows. What we uh, see is that we are increasing the the safety feeling. It's something psychological, but when you enter to a, to a to a bus with a big luminosity, uh, high luminosity, you you feel uh, comfortable. You feel safe also. And then, of course, uh, we thought in uh, to 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 every passenger, we we have to think like, like a passenger, and uh, we uh, realize because now we don't have the the constraints that uh, uh, there are uh, with the with the diesel vehicles. Now we don't have the the rear of the vehicle. We don't have the big engine. Uh, uh, only we have the, uh, uh, an electric motor. And we create in, in at the rear of the vehicle the student zone, because what we see is that in all the cities in the world, all the students are going always to the rear of the bus. So what we said is why we we don't propose uh, this this area that uh, is uh, is very very nice with the USB and for the students is uh, in all the cities that where we propose this uh, this area is very very appreciated. Uh, by by the students and, and by other passengers. Okay, next slide. The driver position uh, very important. We work uh, hard with the UITP uh, in a project that was uh, the European bus system of the future, where uh, we work in the with other manufacturers, other operators uh, in the driver position. Uh, the driver has to be. Uh, for uh, a lot of hours in the same place, so it, it has to be uh, very comfortable. The ergonomic also of the of the driver position uh, has to. Uh, we work a lot this this part, and all the it's true that all the drivers uh, are telling us that they find very well. They find all the buttons. Uh, they find everything uh, close, uh, very handy. Uh, and uh, at the end, of course, uh, we work in, in safety. And uh, one of the improvements that we have done is the the cameras with the uh, mirrors by, by cameras. And it's very appreciated by the driver because that increased the, the safety. But uh, above all, we work a lot uh, the, the visibility of, of the vehicle. 
and uh, with all this with all these these tools that we provide to the to the drivers uh, the drivers are arriving to to have a precision docking and as i said for the for the brt uh, it's very important this precision docking because we we will provide this accessibility and this passenger flow uh, at the station okay ne next please uh, of course uh, as i said uh, before uh, the vehicle propulsion system now is 100 percent electric for me, the, the BRTs uh, should be electric because, as I said, when we compare with, with other transportation modes, like, like uh, a tramway, we are putting the bus to the, to the high level. And now uh, we are having the same energy that the tramway. For me, this is the, the key of, uh, of the success of, of a BRT. So this is a, a, a little bit a, a uh, some some ideas about the the different elements uh, most more focus on, on, on the vehicle uh, when we talk about about brts of course we, we can explain uh, much uh, much more thing about the infrastructure or about operations but i i prefer to focus this uh, for this presentation to some uh, in in some parts of the vehicle and i will finish this uh, presentation uh, telling you about all our concern about uh, sustainability in Irizar because uh, for us as I said when we propose a, a electric vehicle we have to see the full change of uh, the the CO2 uh, high print, uh, footprint <coughs> sorry and as you can see, uh, we are uh, generating all the the production of electricity is green. Uh, we are uh, we have a, a, a photovoltaic uh, farming uh, very close to the uh, to the our factory, and or we have a three megawatts uh, of uh, electricity that is uh, is uh, used. Uh, to, to manufacture our vehicles in our uh, first uh, European electromobility plant that is built uh, with uh, using uh, env environmental and green design principle. And we have also the energy efficiency certificate, the uh, grade A in uh, energy efficiency in this factory. Then, of course, we will uh, build uh, vehicles uh, above all with almost all the components in uh, with uh, local suppliers european suppliers uh, above all, all, almost all, all the components and then we are building also our own batteries uh, as and as we are responsible of uh, the batteries as a producer uh, we have to provide not only the recycling because always people uh, think before to the recycling no we we have to provide first this second life for the batteries and we have already a project uh, in uh, that uh, a pilot project that is in the in the Basque country with uh, a big um, uh, man, uh, man, uh, supplier of uh, of um, I would say uh, electric car uh, uh, servicings uh, for uh, for charging cars, and we will use uh, these uh, batteries uh, in these uh, stations for charging electric cars. Okay, that will be one of our projects for for second life of uh, of the batteries, and then uh, we will reset. Uh, when we finish with this uh, second life of the battery, we will take the, the batteries and we will send to an uh, authorized uh, recycler, recycler uh, these batteries and we will close the, the cycle uh, to be, as I said, uh, sustainable. So uh, this, is, uh, this is all. I would like uh, to thank you for, for your interest in this, uh, in this uh, webinar. And uh, I let Tom uh, to to follow with the with the presentations.
Excellent. Thank you very much, Alberta. And thank you to the people who've been sending questions through using the facility provided. Uh, we're tracking those as they come through and we'll, we'll be looking um, to farm some of those questions out towards the end uh, time permitting. So keep those coming through. So the next presentation, uh, I'd like to welcome Angel Cupra. So she's going to be speaking um, as a city bus operator from Bayonne and Biritz. Um, I will let you introduce yourself if you want to provide any more information on your day-to-day -day role, Angel, um, and pass on for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So hi, everybody. I'm uh, Angel Cupra. And uh, I worked at the Syndicat des Mobilités Pays Basque Adour as a um, vehicle assignment officer. So, next slide, please. So, I will begin, begin by a short presentation of uh, the Syndicat des Mobilités Pays Basque Adour, which is the organizing authority for mobility within its territorial jurisdiction, which, which is made up of the territory of the Basque country urban community, the French part of the Basque uh, country. So uh, as you can see uh, on the map below, it is a vast and contrasting territory. Uh, we have a coastline which is very urbanized and we have a, an hinterland which is more uh, rural and uh, mountainous. So uh, the syndicat has to organize and operate a regular transport service for urban and non-urban people. Uh, we have to develop all the structuring access of public transport, and uh, we contribute to the development of non-motorized modes of land travel and the shared use of uh, motorized land uh, vehicles. So you can pass. Thanks. It's Excuse me. So, due to this uh, context, uh, the Syndicat des Mobilités has chosen to uh, to has uh, chosen sorry the Irisa IE tram vehicles for uh, its two structuring uh, lines, which cross the city of Bayonne, Anglet, uh, Biarritz, and uh, Tarnos, which are locate, located on the coastline and are the most populated cities uh, of the, the area. So we choose that uh, this vehicle because it has both advantages of a tramway and a thermal bus, like uh, Alberto uh, said uh, previously. So uh, for the tramway part, it is uh, the speed, the punctuality, big capacity. Uh, that, is, it, that is interesting for, for us and for the bus, the best part, sorry, uh, it is the, uh, the, low, the lower infrastructure cost and uh, an operating uh, flexibility that, uh, that is interesting for, for the syndicat. Uh, besides, uh, we can say that uh, there was a strong political will to have a zero emission vehicle uh, on the territory. So that's why uh, the electric uh, transport system uh, i.e. tram Irisa was a, was a good choice uh, for, for us. Okay. So uh, we also choose uh, the, uh, the, the i.e. tram, sorry, uh, because in addition of, a, of an electric vehicle, Irisa provided us a global system which include uh, so the rolling stock, the charging system, the uh, supervision software, and a local maintenance maintenance team. Sorry. Uh, we also have opportunity charging station at each terminus. Terminus, sorry, uh, which represent four stations, and we also have a slow overnight charging uh, in the bus depot, which allows us to operate. Uh, 20 hours uh, a day if uh, if needed. So you can see uh, in the picture below a, uh, a bus who, which is uh, currently uh, charging. Okay, next slide. So the general context of the project. 
uh, we chose to create two high quality lines, bus lines, sorry. So I can give you some character characteristics of these lines. So the first one is called uh, Trumbus One, uh, and it's it, it's in operation since uh, September 2099. Uh, so we have 10 buses on this line. Nine are in operation, and one is uh, parked in the depots and used uh, in case of a, in case of a problem. So we have two ultra fast charging stations. Uh, for the first uh, is located in uh, the northeast of Bayonne and is called Eau de Bayonne. And the second one is located uh, in, uh, in uh, the city center of Biarritz and is called Mairie de Biarritz. And the line serves uh, the city of Bayonne, Anglet and Biarritz. It is uh, uh, 12 kilometers long, sorry. It has a frequency of uh, 12 minutes and uh, it has 33 stops. And we will also have a second line in uh, March 2021. Uh, it will have uh, eight buses, also two ultra fast charging stations, one in Tarnos, which is uh, at the north of Bayonne, and uh, one in the, in the center of Bayonne. Donc, uh, sorry. Uh, it will, uh, it is, sorry, uh, 13, 13 kilometers lines and it, uh, it has 31 stop, stops. Okay, next slide, please. So I can, I can give you a few words about the, the operation of the Trumbus uh, Lines 1. So since its launch one year ago, uh, it's the, the Lines uh, has, uh, has made uh, almost uh, 600,000 kilometers. It has carried uh, more than uh, 2 million passengers. And uh, if we make a focus on uh, September 20, uh, 2020, sorry, uh, we can see that the line, the line represents 20% of our traffic on the, urban, on the urban network, which is our most important traffic. Uh, we have uh, an average attendance of about um, one, uh, 100, sorry, 190 uh, passengers. We have an average availability rate of 80%, uh, commercial speed of uh, 17.5 kilometers per hour, and a travel time of, of uh, 15, 15 uh, minutes. So next slide, please. So, uh, sorry. So about the implementations, uh, it implies uh, a lot of uh, discussion between all the past, all the partners, especially regarding the, the design of the of the vehicle, uh, as uh, Alberto said previously. Uh, we've done a lot of quality visits to the factory, especially for the prototype, uh, on which we spend a lot of time, and uh, we also did a. Uh, we also did a quality visit for the following uh, for the following bus before the delivery at our depot. Uh, it was a, a complex project integrated into a more global uh, development project involving many different companies, and uh, it took a lot of coordination to get everyone's work done. So it took six months of work to build this, the charging station. So the opportunity charging station and the, oh, the slow overnight charging station uh, at the bus depot. And uh, the, sorry. And uh, the test and, commission, uh, test and commissioning uh, took uh, one month. So next slide. So uh, 
the despite a, a little difficult start we we now have positive uh, feedback of uh, all the customers so uh, indeed they they like the they, they like the, the buses they are good looking comfortable uh, we also have some technical issues with the vehicle and the, the charging station uh, and they are currently being solved uh, at the beginning we can say that the, the main problems uh, concerned uh, the unit battery packs traction traction uh, system air conditioners door etc and uh, now the the things are are improving uh, today it's much more it's uh, much more better than in the beginning and uh, i have to say that it, it is very helpful to have a, a local man maintenance team and a dedicated uh, after sales uh, team uh, on our on our spots Okay, so at the end of my of my presentation, I don't know if uh, if you have any questions. I think if it's okay with you, we'll um, come back to questions at the end. Um, we'll do a full round of questions. Is that okay? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so next we're on to Miriam Azamendi, um, and you're going to be representing Hema Energy. Uh, I believe it's all to do with the charging stations and the crux of it, really, what makes these systems fantastic and great for the environment. So thank you, Miriam. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation to participate in, in this session. So before starting to explain the different aspects of this project, uh, some information related to Gemma Energy in a few words. Uh, we are a power electronics company with more than 65 years of experience based in the north of Spain and part of it is our group since 2009. So we have uh, more than 400 projects throughout the five continents and although we have several business units, units as you can see in this slide, uh, the top three, if we can call them like that, would be big science, uh, renewables and e-mobility. Summarizing what we do in each one of them in few words, big science, uh, power conversion systems for nuclear fusion and particle accelerators. In renewables, uh, we do photovoltaic inverters and battery energy storage systems, also known as BES. And in e-mobility, uh, charging stations, of course, and uh, different in-vehicles, uh, in-vehicle electronics. So going into more detail in the project at hand and by John and Biarritz, uh, during the next minutes, uh, I will give a brief explanation on the loading solutions uh, developed. Uh, it will be divided between the charging stations for the depot and the opportunity stations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so in the present project, uh, 18 electric buses were delivered. Uh, the amount of energy embarked uh, is not enough for a full day operation without intermediate charges. That is why the buses need high power charges during the day and low power during the night. Both types of, of chargers are, are DC type. Uh, so um, one of the first steps, uh, once the embarked power uh, was defined and knowing the maximum charging time available uh, to charge the entire fleet at the depot at night uh, was to select the appropriate night charger. Uh, the other one would be, of course, the opportunity charger that will come a little bit later. So within the solutions uh, of the depot chargers offered by, by Gemma, which range from uh, 20 kilowatts to 200 kilowatts, it was opted for a 2 times 50 kilowatt solution. What does this mean? So uh, it's two independent chargers uh, with a maximum power of uh, 50 kilowatt per enclosure or cabinet. Uh, so this way, what what we achieve is um, to reduce the, the volume of the cabinets to be installed in the depot uh, by half. So all, well, in this case, uh, all the night chargers uh, have a cable or combo to outlet. A pantographic uh, charging solution is also available. Uh, all chargers, no matter if it's a combo output pantographic or pantographic, um, let's say, solution, are interoperable uh, according to the ISO 15118 standard 
uh, that it's a key aspect for, for bus operators uh, nowadays. In order to, let's say, mix uh, the different uh, bus, uh, different uh, brand of buses with uh, charging uh, suppliers and, and vice versa. So uh, the chargers uh, were delivered in two steps, uh, following a little bit the, the client's need. So the first two char chargers uh, were delivered around two, April 2019, and the rest at the end of the same year. So at the depot charging um, time for each uh, vehicle uh, depends of, on the state of, of charge or state of batteries uh, in which uh, they arrive. Uh, but uh, let's say between the amount of energy embarked and the power of the chargers, the 50 kilowatt chargers mentioned before, this is usually less than one hour. So, although, and, and we also know that uh, these batteries, uh, let's say, need an, an opportunity charging station uh, of, uh, well, in this case, it's uh, of up to five, uh, 500 kilowatts. Uh, the in the night charging, uh, charging uh, it is advocated for, let's say, chargers of lower power that help uh, to balance the cells of the batteries. Uh, that way we increase the life expectancy of, of the vehicle at, at, as, as the whole. Uh, two supervision systems were installed in this case uh, to monitor the depot and the opportunity charging loads. Uh, one is proprietary from, from, let's say, from a third company of, of the Irizar group, and the other one uh, was specific uh, to, the, to the client uh, request. Uh, in this case, uh, none of the, uh, let's say, none of the supervision system uh, follow the OCPP. However, uh, if a client needs, uh, needs uh, the, the charges to have uh, this, kind, this type of communication, uh, we have all, already implemented it. And also, finally, uh, a fleet uh, load management system was also installed, uh, which uh, its goal is to reduce or minimize the peak power uh, that uh, could occur if all the buses are connected at the same time. The next uh, slide, please. Okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, due to the low energy embarked in, in these vehicles, Opportunity chargers are installed at the end of, of each line to recharge the batteries, increasing the autonomy of the vehicle in such a way that they could be circulating indefinitely, uh, if, we, if we had the, the, let's say, the manpower to do so, at least. Uh, the opportunity chargers installed in, in Bayonne and Villarit, uh, nowadays uh, we are working in the next uh, two, as Angel has explained, uh, have a power of 500 kilowatts. And at all times, the energy injected to the batteries is the one that they demand, being the maximum 500, of course. Um, looking at the, let's say, at the, at the data that we have uh, recollected, we see that there are around 150 processes or charging processes per day, and the mean charging time is less than three minutes. So as you can see, it's quite fast. And it can be done uh, while uh, passengers are going up and down the, the and down the vehicle. Another point that electric companies uh, tend to look at more and more closely is the harmonic distortion generated in the in the network. With the electrification of public transport, uh, more elements are connected to the grid, and all of them have have to coexist in, in some way. So our chargers uh, have, uh, let's say, an AC side configuration that reduces the THT or, the to or total harmonic distortion to values uh, below 300, or 300%, 3%, sorry. Uh, as part of a turnkey solution, uh, in this case, uh, a connection to medium voltage uh, was required, uh, 20 kilowatts uh, in, in this specific project. So as previously mentioned, uh, due to our experience in different type of, of projects and, and countries, uh, we look for the most suitable partnership uh, to fulfill uh, the legislation of each country, as let's say uh, each one has its own characteristics or, or specification that, make, that makes it uh, different from, from, in this case, a Spanish one, uh, which would be the one that we know more. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so as mentioned in the previous slide, uh, in this project, uh, two opportunity chargers were installed, one at the end of each line. And in order to reduce the, the visual impact, let's say we adjust a little bit to the needs of the client. 
In this case, one of the solutions was installed in a prefabricated building and the other one in a pre-existing building. Uh, in both cases, uh, the solution consisted uh, on protection cells, uh, size to maximum consumption, um, a medium voltage low, low voltage transformer, and all the low voltage switch gear required to supply voltage to the charger and the auxiliary communication cabinets. So all the works were done in compliance with uh, local regula uh, regulation and were legalized, of course, before the, their energization uh, by an official organism. As indicated with the, with the depot chargers, uh, the opportunity chargers also follow the ISO 1511-8 uh, interoperability standard. Uh, that we also have been working in the Assured project, as uh, if you can remember, uh, Arno, uh, let's say, mentioned it in, in, his, uh, in his part of the, of the presentation. Uh, so, well, to, to end up with, uh, with my part, uh, these were the, the challenges or, or main point, points that arose in this project. Uh, nevertheless, uh, inside the term, his solution portfolio that, uh, that we as, uh, let's say, Gemma and Irisa uh, offer, Clients can find uh, inverted pantograph or type A um, pantograph solution, uh, tightening solutions to minimize the TCO costs, or let's say any other um, technology answers to any other technolo technological challenges uh, that arose in other projects or that may arose in their own projects. So let's say we are open to always find uh, the best solution for, for our clients. And yeah, uh, thank you very much. And um, let's say looking forward to answering uh, the questions in the Q&A section. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Miriam. Um, so we've got one final speaker, Mike Weston, here is our strategic advisor. I think you're just going to say a few words and then we'll we'll move on to some Q&A. Great. Uh, thanks, Tom. i um, just like to spend the next few minutes um, prior to Q&A session giving a brief overview of the ERT scheme in a reserve of delivered to the city of Amiens in northern France um, uh, in conjunction with both the city and uh, the operator Keolis. Uh, Irizar and BRT UK next year are planning a technical visit uh, to the site in probably September, October and I'll provide you a little bit more information at the end for anybody that might be interested in, in joining that visit. Um, so the city of Amiens originally aspirations for a traditional tram system, but with a population of less than 350,000, it concluded that the traditional tram system was probably unviable and probably unaffordable. Um, so instead, they set about delivering a bus-based scheme with high levels of dedicated bus priority. Uh, they've achieved about 50% dedicated bus priority on this on this network um, at about a quarter of the cost of a traditional uh, tram scheme, and in far quicker uh, in terms of delivery than a conventional tram. Um, so as part of this project, Irizar have delivered um, the vehicles and the charging infrastructure in less than 18 months from start to finish of the of the project. Next slide. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, the city wanted a bus that had uh, more of a, a look and feel of a tram, uh, similar aspirations to uh, Bayonne and Bay Ritz, um, and hence we have delivered 18, uh, 43 of the 18 metre trams into the city and six fast charging stations and pantographs at each terminal, plus 43 slow charging uh, stations for the, the, the depot. Um, as you'll see there, we also have entered into a 15-year maintenance and repair contract, which shows Irizar's long-term commitment to the customer and to the city um, that we're supporting. Next slide. So um, the BRT system in Amiens consists actually of four new BRT lines. Uh, the, the, the fourth one is still operated by 18 meter diesel vehicles, um, but will convert uh, at some point in the future to electric operation. So these are the three lines that will be converted to the IE tram and opportunity charging electric. As I say, the fourth will be, will be converted later. At each terminal, the bus will charge for about three minutes to replace the energy that it's consumed on the previous trip. Um, and this network has allowed 65% of Amion's population to be within 400 metres of the new BRT system or new BRT bus stop. Um, also interesting how the scheme's been funding, combination of both uh, national um, grants, but also local employer and government taxation, which is, is used to directly improve public transport. 
across the across the city. Um, so a very interesting scheme. Um, we had been planning, sorry, next slide, to organise a technical visit to Amiens this year, but due to the impact of COVID, we've had to delay that. So we're planning in conjunction with BRT UK to organise a visit to see both the, the network uh, visit the depot, but also hear from some of the, lo the locals involved in the city and the and the politicians in terms of what their aspirations were and what benefits they've achieved from introducing this new BRT system. So at the moment, the technical visit is planned for September, October next year. Uh, and if anybody's interested, if you email John Carr at the email address on the screen now, um, the BRT UK, he will keep you updated on the arrangements and make sure you're invited into the future um, so that's really all i want to say um, hopefully this what you've seen of this scheme in conjunction with the bayon scheme shows you what can be achieved with um, buses and, and brt and how it can how it can massively improve the the transport network in the city great thank you thanks tom excellent thanks mike and if you could just stay on mike so i might need yeah. your help directing some of these questions towards people and then we'll bring them into the conversation um the first one i'm going to combine two questions because they're broadly along similar lines and it's around modal shift and the potential for modal shift with these very high quality bus schemes um so Hugh would have the best understanding of you know what proportion of the new passengers potentially um you know a, a, well, potential the, the passengers on these systems are they entirely new to the bus network, or are they existing bus users? And then what? How might um, the uptake of a very high quality system like this compare to that of a, a tram system or, or light rail? Yeah, I think Alberto probably. Cause I know he's got a lot of experience in previous roles of the BRT and tram systems. So if Alberto is there, perhaps he could pick up this question yes uh, we, we, sorry I, I didn't hear very well the the, the question could you, could you repeat please that's okay I probably didn't ask it very clearly so how do these um, very high quality bus systems compare to a tram system in terms of uptake usage passenger preference are they as popular as tram systems almost as popular more popular? They are almost uh, this popular, but the, the thing is that in the cities uh, where uh, we are uh, put this BRT system, uh, they didn't have tramway. So uh, in Amiens, for example, uh, as Mike said, uh, at the beginning, uh, all the studies were done to, to build a tramway, and at the end, they decided to, to build a, a BRT. Uh, for me, for me, is uh, the same popularity, but uh, you could have biggest popularity because you have more impact in people in the city. Because as, as you see, in the lines that you have in Amiens or in the lines that you have in Bayonne, Biarritz, uh, Anglet, uh, that are very large, you have more impact in in uh, surface that you will have in uh, for the same cost. Uh, with a tramway, because, uh, for example, for instance, in, in Amiens, the cost of, of the project was uh, 122 million. Uh, with this uh, cost, you you has built three BRT lines that are crossing the the the, the city. So the the uh, the people that we are moving uh, is a is a high level. Of course, we we cannot compare uh, to a transportation mode like a tramway. Uh, regarding the system capacity, if we increase uh, the, the, the passengers, uh, uh, the idea is that, that a BRT become one day a, a tramway when you have a, a huge uh, uh, passenger uh, rider, ridership. Uh, but uh, of course, you have a huge impact. And, and above all, uh, the image uh, is, uh, as I said, is very important. The image uh, that people is uh, the identification that people is, is giving to this uh, kind of system is uh, is huge. And and uh, when we did all the all the when when the PTA did all the all the studies about satisfaction of the clients uh, were very very high. 
Do you have any data uh, or evidence, you know, that you could pass on to other scheme promoters that they can show politicians, look, this is successful, this is popular? Uh, for the politicians, uh, what they can say is that uh, in the three cities uh, in France where we install uh, these BRT systems, the politicians of these three cities were re-elected. So uh, for me, is uh, the investment that they have done by the city was very appreciated by the users. It was very appreciated by the, the citizens of, of these uh, cities because at the end, the, the only evaluation that a, pol a politician has are the votes. So as I said, they were re-elected. So for me, it was a, was a, a very successful project from uh, all, all point of view, even, even uh, from the political point of view. Good, good. Well, there'll be lots of politicians planning schemes like this that are happy to to hear that type of um, experience. Yeah, Tom, I'll, just, I'll just add, Tom, that we, we've taken a few UK cities and some of their lead councillors to Amiens and, and one of the other attractions as well as the cost and what they've seen in terms of what can be delivered is that actually can be delivered relatively quickly and you know potentially within a, a council's four-year term of office um, which you know I know it's political but actually it is quite important because they, they want to be seen to deliver things and, and, and so the attraction also is the speed of delivery compared with a conventional tram system. Okay um, I'll go into some more questions. Um, there's a question here. Uh, bear me one second. So there's a question around the emissions, um, the pollution uh, from the road, from the tyres, the brake dust. Um, do, you, do you have any evidence around that? Those emissions, which we might not see with a, a, a tramway or of some other means of, of transport, is it, is it being monitored or measured? No, no, no. By the moment, uh, what we can say is that we are using the brake less that than with the diesel buses, because uh, we have uh, a way of braking when uh, it's a regenerative regenerative uh, braking that is using uh, is used to to charge the batteries. So we are using this energy of the of the braking to to charge the batteries, and we are using less. The, the brakes. Uh, so uh, when we when we when we talk about uh, uh, pollution of this uh, the plaquettes of the of the brake uh, of the brakes is uh, is very very low because we are not consuming a lot in uh, during the during the braking uh, uh, situation. Excellent. Um, another quite technical question. Um, about the charging points, the opportunity charging points. Um, obviously, it has to be quite precise with the docking. Um, is there an additional optical or automatic aid, or is this done through the driver's uh, skill alone? How do you get the opportunity charging and the fixing correct? Uh, you want, Miriam, what, what, what we have done is, uh, is, is an operation point. Uh, uh, we, ha we are giving some help to the drivers. So we have a camera uh, that is used to, to see the pantograph. Uh, this camera uh, has a screen at the interior of the vehicle and, and the, we are using also some reference for the drivers. And uh, with this uh, orientation, with this uh, reference that we have on the street, are uh, sufficient to have a, a good docking. We don't need a, a precision docking because uh, we have a big tolerance of the in the pantograph, you know. So, uh, but of course, uh, we need uh, to provide a good training to the drivers. Uh, to, to do some tests during the testing and commissioning. We are doing also the training and we can see that drivers are learning uh, and uh, when we start operations, they are increased learning and uh, we can see that uh, we are not losing uh, a lot of charging for, for a bad positioning of the bus, you know. 
but it, it could happen at the beginning. So that's why a good training is important. I don't know if, if Miriam has uh, one wants to add uh, something else about the the charging. Uh, no, uh, you just covered it all. It's a learning curve how to how to use it in a precisely mode. So yeah, it takes it takes some some time and some uh, let's say uh, uh, teaching and learning. Uh, so yeah, everything covered by the explanation of of Alberto. And it's a bit of a side point, but in the city that I live in, we have thousands of bus drivers. The bus drivers like this technology, the quality of the buses. They enjoy this new, these new systems. Good re response from the drivers. Yes, uh, they, they are. Uh, they they like uh, this new system because for them, uh, they are they are used to have only uh, diesel buses. Uh, sometimes very very old. Uh, in some cities, uh, so when you bring this new technology, uh, with this new energy, with the, these new trainings, with this, as I said, with this ergonomic uh, uh, driver position, with all these cameras to see uh, to increase the safety also of the vehicle, uh, all this is very appreciated by the drivers, and uh, we have a, we have a, a, a good feedback of the of the way they, they drive the, the vehicles, yes. So I'm going to run through some of the questions um, quite quickly. Um, could we follow up again on, on the modal shift? So what percentage of the people using the systems do you think previously drove, you know, they would drive that journey, but now they travel by bus? Is it is it 5%, 10%, 50%? I don't know if uh, Angel uh, has some figures. Uh, normally, from my experience uh, in BRT, when you change, uh, when you have the install a, a new BRT lines, the you increase the, the the ridership compared to to regular lines of 25 to 35 percent. So uh, in 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 all these cities, I think uh, we have uh, in Amiens, uh, Bayonne, Biarritz, uh, Anglet, also in Aix-en-Provence, we, we have a very good uh, uh, patronage, and is uh, is still increasing, you know. Yep. Okay, so I've got a question for Anna. If uh, oh sorry, Angel, did you want to chip in there? Uh, yeah. I wanted to add that uh, uh, indeed we have a, a model shift, but uh, it not uh, for, for us is it is not as good as uh, Alberto said. We have to improve uh, to improve uh, ourselves uh, a little more. Okay, a um, couple more questions. We can squeeze them in. So Anna, if you're still um, around, um, I've got a question for you. So what do we think the European Union is going to do with thousands of Euro 6 buses? Um, so these are the, you know, the latest low emission diesel buses that have been purchased over the last, I don't know, couple of years, five years. Um, Arno, are you, are you on? Sure. Uh, yeah, probably since 2014 or 2015, when, when the Euro 6 became compulsory uh, in Europe for for new procurements. Um, yeah, what, what, what I showed in the beginning of the introduction, uh, that you saw the mandatory targets uh, for, uh, for member states, which, uh, which are 45% uh, uh, for clean buses, uh, which means that 55% still of the public procurements can remain uh, and will remain probably diesel. Right, so uh, we see that there will be, uh, yeah, for sure in, uh, in the coming decade, also a future. Uh, although, uh, yeah, it will be smaller, but there is still a future for uh, for Euro six uh, diesel buses. Uh, yeah, maybe for specific applications, maybe outside city centres, maybe in specific uh, yeah, transport uh, transport areas. Uh, but overall, uh, more, yeah, more we, rural. Yeah, probably probably rural or uh, maybe peri peri urban uh, or maybe smaller cities, uh, county uh, smaller counties, where uh, where maybe they have less opportunity to electrify uh, the system. Um, and yeah, we expect where we anticipate that the number of diesel buses will uh, shrink, and nonetheless, including uh, including new per case of Euro six buses. 
so we are working in UITP with uh, yeah, currently on, on a study together with the European Investment Bank to also investigate uh, what happens with the second-hand uh, market for uh, for city buses uh, in Europe. So we, we do expect that there will be some changes also in uh, in, uh, in second-hand uh, yeah, market characteristics uh, in uh, in Europe. Uh, and we do uh, yeah, also anticipate that maybe specifically in competitive markets where there are uh, concessions tendered with uh, this very tight maximum uh, rolling stock age, that there will be uh, additional, uh, let's say, Euro 6 buses that will become uh, available or redundant uh, when those uh, areas will, uh, will electrify. And uh, yeah, we could imagine that there are, let's say, still for these buses uh, an opportunity to be reused or to be uh, to have a second life in other places uh, of Europe. And what I mentioned, so Europe is it is it is high and it is it is it is long and broad. Uh, and uh, why not uh, thinking of uh, replacing very old uh, city buses of Euro Zero, Euro E One, with uh, yeah with very very good uh, Euro Five, Euro Six buses uh, in other places. So uh, we anticipate that the dynamics will change. And uh, yeah, we uh, yeah we, we work with the with the partners, including the European Investment Bank, also which have uh, solutions for that. Thank you very much for that, Arno. I'm going to try fly through some more questions. Uh, operational, Alberta. Um, I think we saw some average speeds, but what? Um, bear me a second. What kind of speeds can these vehicles do in operation? The maximum on route. Uh, the, the maximum we have, uh, we can go until uh, 70 uh, kilometers per hour when we are outside of the of the city, of course. Uh, when when we are inside the city is uh, uh, 50, uh, um, in some areas are 30. Uh, but as uh, as you see, uh, when when we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, stations, uh, right now the average speed. Uh, as Angel uh, uh, put in in uh, in, uh, in the some of the slides is uh, between 17, 18 kilometers. That uh, is 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 still a, a little below for for a BRT because normally uh, what we are finding in, in in other cities is around 20 or over 20 kilometers. Uh, but this is is uh, quite good, uh, and I think. Uh, uh, we we have uh, we, we if we could work a, a little bit about uh, this uh, as I said this uh, dwell time at, at, at the stations to reduce uh, this uh, to win some seconds uh, we will increase the, the average speed but normally as I said this uh, 70 uh, is the the maximal speed of, of this vehicle we we can go uh, more than that uh, but normally it's not uh, demanded by the cities to go over uh, 85 uh, kilometers but in in other countries we can go to of course to to 85 kilometers uh, to with this uh, with this kind of vehicle yes excellent um i think we are coming up to uh, 4 p.m here in the uk um but i think we can probably do another i know we can run over by a couple of minutes mike would you like for us to carry on i've got a few more questions if people can can stay on Okay, so uh, yeah. there's a couple of questions yeah. about the, um, again, people very interested in the operational side. What, what's the working life of the vehicles and their resale value? So after how many years would they need to be um, updated interior? And then and then how long can we expect the vehicle to last uh, full stop? It's uh, 15 years is the life expectancy of uh, these vehicles. Uh, so then, uh, uh, we normally uh, in in urban transport uh, for this kind of vehicles, we we don't resale again the the vehicles to other city after 15 years. So uh, normally the, the the PTA will buy the vehicles and, and they will use it until until the the, the end of uh, of their life. But this is 15 years. Okay. I've got a question for Angel. Uh, she mentioned 86% availability. Um, could you elaborate on what do we mean by 86% availability? Yeah. 
Uh, sure. That means that uh, we have, um, how can I explain this? Uh, be, between the, all the stops of the vehicles for uh, maintenance, uh, maintenance operation, or um, uh, sorry, I'm looking for the word of breakdown. Uh, in a in a month, we have about 80 85 percent of uh, avail availability. I don't know if it's uh, clearer. So the vehicles are being maintained or they're off the road and not being used 14% yeah. of the time, 15% of the time. Yeah, that's it. Uh, that was the, the average of the, of the month. So we have to replace a vehicle by another or, or we by another electric bus or uh, a thermal bus uh, if we don't have uh, enough uh, electrical enough electric vehicles. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Mike, this is maybe one for you, I'm not sure, but how much is one of these going to cost me? I want an 18 metre, top of the range, bespoke interior, sexy vehicle, how much is that going to cost me? I mean, it, it, it really depends on how many, how many you, you're gonna, you're gonna, you want to buy, really. Um, but I mean, you're talking, you know, it, it's, I, I don't know who, who's asking the question and what, and what the, but there's the, it's obviously an expensive vehicle. I mean, you're talking, a, you know, over a half a million pound for it. But I, I think it's got to be. They've clarified here. Yeah, sorry, they want 18 vehicles. This person, so maybe you've got a potential <laughs> sale. Well, if they if they email Sean at the end, I'm sure he'll give them a proper quote. But I think the important thing is this is a this is a yeah a high quality high end vehicle that's been introduced as part of a system with opportunity charging, usually with BRT and and high levels of bus priority. Um, and you know that what, what it can achieve as part of that system compared with the tram is significant. So, uh, yeah, and I think that that's the sort of benchmark we're trying to compare it against. Yeah, um, you know, we, we're trying to show that we're trying to sell a system that's good value compared with what the real alternative is. And the real alternative is not a diesel bus. The real alternative is a a tram scheme. Um, so, I think for cities that we're talking to um that that's they they see that and they see that what they're getting for their for their for their for their money um so we're looking at more, so we're, we're looking at closer to a million pounds for a very high-end high specification vehicle than we would be half a million pounds or you no, no, near, near to, no yeah near nearer to half but nearer to half a million but but i think the issue is um I think you, you've also got to look at the one of the opportunities. Opportunity charging one of the advantages is, you know, some attractive total cost of operation compared yeah. with um, for, for depot charge vehicles on very intensively run routes. You, know, you, you don't need extra vehicles to charge during the day. So obviously the TCO is an important calculation as part of the decision process as well. I have one last question. I think on this. Apologies, there are going to be questions that we've not been able to answer. Um, uh, but the, the last question is around that. So operating costs, how do they compare uh, to a diesel network? If you were if you were running that entire system on those example systems using diesel vehicles, what would we expect the cost to be uh, day to day? Yeah, I mean, if you look at if you look at a TCA, a total cost of ownership model for for most countries, the, the, the benefit will be that you will have lower energy costs and compared with diesel and, and and lower maintenance costs because you've got a less complicated diesel engine you know you haven't got a diesel engine you've got less less moving parts so the, the the total cost of ownership model will be a high capital upfront payment um to to, in, to compared with diesel but then you recover over the 15 years life of the vehicle um because of lower energy costs but that does depend on the local taxation on diesel so that that will vary from European country to European country. I don't know whether Arno has got any observations on that. Um, but yeah, your operating costs should be lower compared with diesel, which helps pay for the higher upfront capital costs. Would you yeah, I, 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 can, I can confirm. I, sorry, yeah, just to confirm that there, yeah, there, there's, there's a high variability of, uh, of let's say, taxations uh, across uh, across European member states. So we are not there yet to have one, let's say, unified. Uh, a unified tax system, which is also true, by the way, for the prices. 
so we, uh, of course, from the ITP perspective, we, we very much do uh, do lobby in favor uh, for electric bus uh, system, and electricity supply for public transportation that is considered as the same tax regime as it is for uh, for trains or for metros, for instance. But this is definitely not ultimately the case uh, everywhere in Europe. So there's there's still lots of work uh, to be done. And also, this although operational costs are important, normally it's public money sometimes being invested in these schemes. There is a cost uh, in terms of well, there's a benefit there: the lower emissions, the lower pollutants, uh, the the noise, the the vibrations. You know, these are often not costed, um, but there there is a cost to them. Um, okay. Well, I think we'll have to draw a close. Uh, so I apologize if people have submitted questions that they've not been able to have answered. Um, I will ask that when Landor um, send around a copy of the slides and a recording, maybe we could provide the contact details of each of the presenters um, and, and then people could seek direct contact uh, with further questions. I'm sure you'd, you'd welcome, you would welcome those. Um, but I want to take the opportunity again, as I started out, by thanking Landor Links for coordinating this webinar. I want to thank Irizar um, explicitly for, for them helping uh, bring it all together. And I want to thank all of our, our speakers and presenters for fantastic presentations and for taking the time to stay on as well for a few questions and answers. Um, so I hope people have found that very useful. Um, and uh, yes, thank you very much, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your your evening. Right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah. Pleasure. Thank you Bye. very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.